It is a real privilege to be invited to come and try and make some small contribution to the really important work that's being done here. Uh, I'm more than a little intimidating as I look at the richness of what's been done over the course of the past 10 days and as I was trying to think to myself about what I could possibly hope to contribute. So I decided that what is probably the most useful thing for me to do is reflect back to you some of my sense of what I've seen as the vision that underpins this event and why these elements are significant to me in my experience and my inter-church work. And I would say, first of all, that a major achievement has been the way that you have put the word forgiveness out there for people to encounter and to engage with it. A politician at an event I organised a few weeks ago said that the absence of forgiveness is poisoning our political and public discourse. People are still holding on to anger for things that happened centuries ago, never mind the more recent past. And while that's still the case, how can we hope to build a stable foundation for a genuinely shared society, and one in which we're not always just lurching from crisis to crisis? Fundamentally, it's about digging deeper. And a lot of the painful realities we're dealing with now the political breakdown and its devastating consequences for our communities, the challenge of Brexit and the increased polarisation that it's brought, together with the fact that violence continues to blight the lives of so many people across the city and beyond, all of this clearly prompts us to confront the reality of an unfinished peace and to ask ourselves what's been missing. And the theme of this year's Four Corners suggests to people that this might be forgiveness. The messages that have been coming out across different forms of media since well before the festival started have been prompting people to reflect on this. And so I think for starters, just to provide that stimulus so that people are encountering the word forgiveness as they're flicking through the paper, changing channels on the radio or scrolling through social media is an important contribution, particularly when you consider the language and tone of so much of the rest of what they're gonna be finding there. And from what I've seen, those who've been motivated to dig a little deeper, to come to these events, to read the articles, listen to the discussions on the radio, watch the videos, will have found throughout that this has been done in a really respectful way. One that allows space for different experiences, interpretations and perspectives. Because as you've rightly noted, this is something that can be and is contentious, scandalous to use your word. And the sense I've had of what you've done here has been one of an invitation to dialogue. And so first and foremost, I would underline the significance of the theme and the successful model for engagement that you've used, which is something that can be and needs to be replicated just as it is. There's a powerful simplicity to the idea of invitation, which has strong Christian foundations in the principle and practice of hospitality that we find throughout scripture and is of course central to what Four Corners is all about. And I find that interesting on this specific theme of forgiveness because it reminds me of one of the most incredible and inspiring examples of forgiveness I've ever witnessed. And that was two years ago at the World Council of Churches when the Dutch Reformed Church of South Africa was invited back into membership, having been banned for decades over its support of apartheid. And when the clerk of that church addressed the assembly after the motion had been passed, he spoke with real emotion of their gratitude to the other South African churches who had forgiven them for the past behaviors that they now accepted were sinful. And through his tears, he said, we closed the door, but our brothers and sisters never did. And for me, that was a really helpful image because in a lot of my work up to that point around forgiveness, we had, as David referred to earlier, tied ourselves up in knots about this relationship between forgiveness and repentance and whether you could have forgiveness without repentance. And it's very difficult to model something and support people in their journey towards it if you don't have a clear understanding of what it is or what it should be. But this idea of leaving the door open and letting people know that it's open for them should they decide to do what's necessary to walk through it. I think is much easier to get your head around. And even if it's not forgiveness complete and of itself, 
it's still that openness to forgiveness and the hope that forgiveness might be possible. And of course, Four Corners is very much about throwing open the doors and telling people that they're welcome. And it's important that we don't take for granted the fact that it takes courage to do this in Belfast. The city bears the physical scars of our conflict in a very real way before we even start to think about the human impact. In some of the consultation work we've done recently as churches around Brexit and pastoral responses to the challenges it poses, some people have rightly pointed out that while we're all getting very exercised about the possible return of a hard border to this island, there are people in this city living on peace lines who have continued to live out their daily lives in the shadow of the hardest of hard borders and there hasn't been that same concern by the whole of society. So it's not only important to do all we can to keep the focus on the ways in which people have been left behind, to seek the good of the city in the words of Jeremiah, or the welfare or the peace of the city, depending on which translation you look at. But we also need to remember, I think, that this wounded city around the world is at once synonymous with conflict and division, and yet also has been able to be a beacon of hope. And the visitors coming here, I think particularly from Colombia in recent years, have been an important and I think a timely reminder of that. So with that in mind, I'd like to share a couple more things from my international experience that have come to mind as I've been preparing for tonight. The first is from the US. Last year, I attended the launch of a new leadership institute in faith and education at Harvard University. And one of the speakers who was setting the scene for us was Dr. David Ireland, who's a pastor who does a lot of work on reconciliation between different racial and ethnic groups in the US. And he said a couple of things that really spoke to me in my work. And the first was that the shadow of religion and its community should be one of safety. And if we allow our minds to wander around this city, I think we can think of examples of church communities where this has certainly been the case some cases where it has not, and many more, probably the majority, I think struggling along somewhere in the middle, trying to find their role and having some good moments of outreach or some good elements to their witness, but not really finding the way to sustain that witness and engagement in a very holistic way. And Dr. Ireland also talked about how faith communities have an important role to play in challenging attitudes and behaviors that keep people and communities trapped in cycles of pain and disadvantage. But he said, we've got to earn the right to challenge. Some of the strongest criticisms that I've heard from people in Belfast communities about churches have been along the lines of, we're fed up with clergy coming in and trying to fix this community, rather than being willing to journey alongside the community and understand what people have been through and are going through. And I find that sometimes people in positions of church leadership, clergy and lay, can feel a real pressure to fix things. And they can be acting with the best of intentions and often, I think, also out of a real sense of insecurity. They feel this pressure to be the person with the answers. And when there are no easy answers, they can start to worry that they maybe have nothing to offer. And so I was very struck by a contribution from Father Greg Boyle, because of course you also recognize the value of learning from the US context. And it was where he had said, forgiveness allows for your own brokenness and permits a comfort level with the brokenness of others, which all leads us to inhabit our own dignity and the unshakable truth about ourselves, that we are all exactly what God had in mind when God made us. And that brought me back to something very significant I'd heard some years ago in a very different society in Western Ukraine, but one that is also torn apart by conflict. And while I was there on a peace and reconciliation project, I heard a priest who's now a bishop of the Greek Catholic Church in Lviv, Bishop Benedict, preach on the passage from Mark's Gospel, chapter four, where Jesus calms the storm. And Bishop Benedict asked us to reflect on why it was that Jesus was able to calm the storm. And he suggested that it was because he had peace in his heart, unlike his disciples who were weighed down with fear and doubt. And he asked us to think about what this means for each of us in the Christian call to be peacemakers. How can we hope to bring peace to our communities, 
to situations of conflict in our families even, if we come to that situation weighed down with inner turmoil, burdened by inner voices that tell us that we are not enough to make a difference. And he suggested that if we truly wish to follow Christ, to be an instrument of God's peace, then we need to be able to find that inner peace that allows us to say, I, with all my faults and failings, with my frustration, with my anger, I am enough to do some good here. I shared this a couple of years ago with an interchurch group who had asked me to speak about hope in the context of interchurch relations and against the backdrop of political breakdown and rising tensions, because I get all the easy gigs. And I was struck by the strength of people's response to this. Not that it surprised me that a lot of people were feeling that way because obviously I'd chosen that particular reflection because I was conscious that people's morale was really low and that many of those who had worked tirely, tirelessly for peace at great personal cost and sometimes risk over decades were deeply disappointed at where we'd ended up 20 years on from the Good Friday Agreement. And many of them were feeling weary and feeling that they had little left to offer. So what surprised me was not that people had identified with the ideas and the sentiments, but it was how many of them felt like they were the only ones who were feeling like that. And so on top of feeling disappointed and feeling weary, they were also feeling guilty and feeling like they were failures because they were feeling like giving up. And so events like this that bring people together provide an opportunity to remind ourselves of the need for self-compassion. And in this particular theme, that self-compassion gives a solid foundation for forgiveness, from which to reach out and extend forgiveness to others, and also to journey alongside those who are searching for forgiveness. The broken, wounded healer, as Father Greg has pointed out, has so much to offer. We pride ourselves here rightly on being a resilient people with all that we've come through, but this can sometimes cause us to overlook the power that lies in sharing our vulnerability. When I've researched cases where people from churches have provided transformational leadership in communities, it has invariably involved having the courage to ask the difficult questions and listen respectfully to the answers in all their painful complexity. And often what they tell me is that the question that moves people on is not about forgiveness, at least not directly, but it's what kind of future do you want to give to your children? but you can't come in and jump straight to that question. You've got to earn the right. And recently, some of our members in the ICC were reflecting about reconciliation, and they expressed a concern that maybe in our peace process, albeit with the best of intentions, we've tried to jump too quickly to reconciliation, because we can all more or less agree that that's where we want to get to if we don't upset the apple cart by asking too many different difficult questions about how each one understands it and what it should look like and critically what it should feel like. So sometimes we risk ending up with oversimplified and superficial notions of what reconciliation is and how it can be measured. And sometimes we even find it reduced to a numbers game where if we get so many people from this community and so many people from that community and they take part in a project together that that's reconciliation. In Catholic social teaching, we talk about the work of transforming hearts. And this is where churches have a particular role to play and where there's still a lot more work to be done. We are understandably afraid of tackling these big emotional questions and trauma and ending up feeling stuck. But if we don't find a way to acknowledge and deal with people's anger and pain, where do we expect it to go? In one of our working groups reflecting on this theme, we came to the conclusion that a significant element of this needed to be rediscovering lament. Now, fortunately in that working group, there was a Methodist who could point us to the fact that the Methodist Church had done a lot of work around this in 2006 and produced a liturgical resource entitled Healing the Heart, Shaping the Future with a Bible study alongside it by Dr. Johnston McMaster. And a chapter of his Bible study was called They Cried to the Lord, rediscovering lament. So it's one of those moments of mixed emotions where on the one hand you think, well, we've decided this is important, so it's great, somebody's already done a lot of work on this. On the other hand, you're thinking, somebody's already done a lot of work on this. A group of people got together in 2006 and decided this was important and produced a resource and 
here we are in 2018, as it was, rediscovering the need to rediscover lament. But it's interesting when you look back at what Johnson has written in the context of today, and he argues that when a section of the community denies or represses its hurt, anger, and sense of loss or injustice, a collective apathy, social paralysis, or internal, external violence can follow. It's therefore important for individuals and groups to find meaningful, healthy, and non-violent ways to express their deepest feelings, to name pain, to vent anger, rage, or feelings of vengeance. If we think of some of the challenges of where we are now, concerns about collective apathy and social paralysis are very much to the fore. And thinking about it from a specifically Christian and theological perspective, Johnson also pointed out that the anger or rage may be against people or it may be against God. And popular religion and piety has conditioned many to believe that anger and rage against God is wrong or a lack of faith. And he points us to the Jewish tradition and how it's always had this liberating ability to argue with God, to make accusation and complaint and points out that if we look at the Psalms, there are more of lament than of praise. And Jesus, during the crucifixion, uses the words of Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So finally, I think a key aspect of the contribution that's been made here is to find a range of ways through prayer, reflection, arts, physically getting out and walking around and exploring spaces for people to approach these uh, these painful realities in what Johnson has described as healthy ways and ways that leave the door open to hope. So those would be my somewhat disjointed thoughts and to summarise some of the things that I've taken from this that I think should be central to the vision for the way forward are first of all having the courage to name the big questions without feeling that you have to know the answer or answers in advance leaving the door open for people and being proactive yet respectful in the invitation as you let them know that that door is open for them. Speaking up for our local communities so that they don't get left behind while being aware at the same time that we're all part of something much bigger and that wider focus on exchange is important too. And supporting people to have the confidence to make their contribution in whatever way that might be, whatever roles they might have in society, and providing the spaces where we can come to be restored and lifted up by others, and lift others up so that together we're better able to meet the challenges. So again, thank you for the opportunity for me personally, and also for the space that you've provided here for everyone who wants to engage in the conversation. Thank you.